Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us this week at Palm Canyon Church. We'd love for you to stay connected with us throughout the week, wherever you go, and the best way for you to do that is through the Palm Canyon Church app. It's free, and you can download the app from your device's app store. Stay tuned for Senior Pastor Bill Martin and this week's message. Hey, well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to church today. Thank you so much for putting God first, starting your week off the right way. If you're watching online, so glad you're watching and would love for you to let us know where you're watching from. That would be great. If this is your first time, either online or here in person, we welcome you and trust that today's going to be a a game changer for you. I'm realizing that God's blessings are, are amazing and he is so, so good. And uh, that there are good things in your future. And that blessings are chasing you down. You can go back and read it in Deuteronomy 28 too. But the Bible talks about the people of God, the blessings of God. God's blessings are actually chasing you down. You can't outrun them. They're going to overtake you. And that's a great, great promise. But I hope today that you will just embrace God's truth and and let the Word of God uh, get deep inside of you and that you would experience something tremendous in your life. There might be something that you're dealing with that you need an answer for. There might be a problem that you're going through that you need God's help on. And, uh, you know, I I just want to pray for us as we get rolling today. Father, we we come before you, and you've given us the great privilege uh, through your Son, Jesus, to come boldly before your throne of grace. And we come boldly today, Lord, asking for big things from you. You are a big God, and no matter how big that obstacle might seem to us, you are greater than that, Lord. You said that we are more than conquerors, God, Uh, that we are the head, not the tail, and that your blessings are chasing us down, Lord, and we thank you for that, and we embrace that. We just reach out today, Lord, to declare that, God, your saving grace, your life-changing power is real and Uh, That there's healing, Lord, physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, financially, Lord, relationally. And we declare that you are the healer and you're the healer right here in our midst today. And we thank you for just the presence of God and the privilege we have to be in that presence today. In Jesus' name, amen. So if, if this is your first time here and you're a little bit nervous about what to expect, well, first of all, you, you have to admit that the music is, is amazing, you know. Um, so it just is. Whether you like Christian music or not, it's, it's absolutely amazing. Um, relax, we're not going to take your money from you. Um, we don't even pass an offering bag anymore. We just have two boxes on the back wall that you could give if you so choose. But if this is your first time, just chill out. This is really for people who call this place home. Uh, so, you know, hopefully you'll feel like um, you've experienced some family and that you found family and, and we'd love you to be a part of this family and hope you'll come back. If this is your first time. Don't make this your last time. Hopefully you'll, you'll come back again. So recently I uh, was at a magic show and uh, when the magician came out, I realized it was, he was a Mexican magician. And this Mexican magician stood up and said, hey, on the count of three, I'm going to disappear. And without hesitation, he said, uno, dos, and boom, he was gone without a trace. (laughs) For all of us Spanish-speaking people, um, I'm not very bilingual as far as language, but I'm I'm multi-food, whatever, I'll eat about any kind of food. yeah. Some of you, some of you, you know, you, you'll get it eventually. But uh, you know, when you're watching Sesame Street and you hear them, uh, you know, Uno, Dos, Trace. Oh yes, now I got that. Yeah. You know, kids sometimes say the the, the darndest things. That was kind of a TV show a, a while back. But um, you know, it, it is certainly amazing what kids say and how observant they are. You know, I can remember back when our, our, my, our son was, was young, uh, was just a, basically a toddler, four or five years old. Back in that day, we didn't just have church on Sunday morning, we had church on Sunday evening. You know, uh, the, the, the real lovers of God went to church <laughs> twice on Sunday. Um, 
Yeah, I had a professor once say, I'd love to meet the man who started a Sunday night service because I'd like to shoot that guy. But anyway, so, you know, Sunday evening service, there wasn't children's church and that, so the kids would sit in church. And I, I couldn't believe how observant uh, that our son was. But um, he said to me one day, Dad, how come when you get up there, uh, before you uh, start talking, you always bow your head for a second? And I said, well, first of all, I'm thrilled that you're that observant, that you would uh, take notice uh, that I would actually do that. Basically, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm praying that God will help me to preach good, to which he said, how come God doesn't answer your prayer? See, that one was in English, and uh, some of you got that one, so so that's good, just, uh, just moving right along. Um, There's something that I believe that all of us have probably done at least once. Um, I I know you might be thinking, ride a bicycle? No, it's not ride a bicycle. Did you know that roughly one out of ten millennials have never ridden a bicycle? But the figure is almost 100% of those over 50 have ridden a bicycle. Something that we've all probably done. I know you're thinking, read an actual road map. No, it's not read an actual road map. 15%, they say, of millennials have never actually read a physical road map. But I think one thing that we've probably all done before is we have all prayed. Whether you say you believe in God or not, there's probably been at some point in your life, maybe it was a a relative that was sick and you were praying for them, or maybe it was that you needed this job and you prayed about that, or that car broke down and you were praying that God would miraculously heal that car. I mean, there's something about prayer that I I think, you know, we we really do, I think, believe that prayer can literally change things. And so every now and then we pray, hoping that God will say yes. But what happens when that loved one dies? Or what happens when you don't get the job? Or what happens when the car really is a goner? Why does it seem sometimes that God doesn't answer prayer? You've probably experienced that in your own life. I mean, I'm going through some of that even as we speak. Um, Some of you know that my mother, she's 82, um, was diagnosed with Parkinson's, and she's got several other problems as well, but diagnosed with Parkinson's, um, um, I don't know, let's say five, six years ago, something like that, and as time rolls on... um, it's not that she experiences tremors, it's, it's more that she's got uh, what's called a Lewy body dementia that uh, affects her, her thinking, and um, so she has trouble, you know, walking because her brain just tells her to sit down whether there's a chair there or not, or she has hallucinations, fortunately not nightmarish hallucinations, but uh, things like that, and She's, she's living in a facility, and my dad passed away uh, two and a half years ago, and um, so almost every day I pray for one of two things, that either God would heal her and restore her, or that he would take her on to heaven. I probably pray for the latter more than the former, as weird as that sounds. She wants to go be with the Lord, and um, I would love for her to do that as well. Um, it, it's just tough watching people you know, struggle in life. And, um, but that prayer hasn't been answered yet. Uh, so it's easy to start thinking maybe God doesn't answer prayer. There's about seven things I want to tell you today that I think I'm kind of learning about prayer. And yeah, I'm, I'm learning too. I don't consider myself to be an expert. I don't consider myself to be the person who's got this all figured out, and I'm here to tell you, I'm just wanting to share with you a little bit of my journey and kind of what I'm learning along the way. One of those things that I'm learning is that there's no such thing as an unanswered prayer. Whether we think there is, there's really no such thing as an unanswered prayer. The Bible says in Jeremiah 33, 3, call to me and I will answer you. The Lord didn't say call unto me and I might if I'm not busy. 
call unto me and possibly, you know, depending on how good you've been, no, he says, call unto me and I will answer. So if there's no such thing as an unanswered prayer, I'm learning that God answers every prayer with one of two answers. It's either yes or no. Now, the yes might come in yes, but wait, or it might come as yes, but not like that. But the bottom line is that God answers prayer in one of two ways, either yes or no. You probably know that feeling, though, when, when God answers your prayer with a resounding yes. You know how you feel excited, you feel stoked, you feel um, all pumped up because you're thinking, man, God is so amazing, he's so powerful, he's so able, he's so kind, he's so good, he's so, he's so loving, and you know that feeling when you're on cloud nine because he's answered a prayer. There's a story in the Bible about a guy named Jairus who uh, uh, went to Jesus asking him to quickly come to heal his sick daughter. Before Jesus ever got there, this sick 12-year-old daughter died. But when Jesus showed up and went into the room, miraculously, he raised her up. She was raised from the dead. She was healed. Now imagine how pumped up, how excited, and how stoked you would be is certainly you would feel like you were on cloud nine that God had answered your prayer. Many of you know the story about my dad back in 1993. Uh, yeah, about 1993, my dad was diagnosed with, uh, with, with leukemia um, and, and really wasn't given much hope. And... Um, I still remember the day that um, he, he was in heart failure in ICU and nobody was expecting him to live. The doctor had told me, you know, if you want to see your dad, I suggest you come now. And um, I flew there and walked into this ICU unit and laid hands on my dad and prayed for him. And boom, miraculously, everything turned around. Within a day or so, he was home and he never had another trace of cancer ever. He lived another 25 years, 24, 25 years. You know what, when you get that kind of news, you talk about being excited and stoked and pumped and thinking you can take on the world, that's that's kind of how that feels. But it's a much different feeling when a no comes whistling down the hallways of your heart. A no kind of knocks the wind out of you. It kind of makes you feel like maybe God's punishing you. Or maybe God's not answering because he disapproves of you. And you're feeling like, this is unfair, this is not right, maybe God's not really good, maybe God doesn't really even exist. You've prayed, but the pain hasn't gone away. You've prayed, but the loss hasn't stopped hurting. You've prayed, but the illness is still there. You've prayed, the loneliness keeps aching. You've prayed, but the memories aren't fading. Now, if your view of God is that he's more like a vending machine, of course you're going to be upset when you press the button of the machine and God says no and what you ask for doesn't come out. Of course you're going to be upset. But if you've ever felt God saying no to you, you're probably in pretty good company. The Bible tells us about Paul, the apostle. Imagine how he must have felt when he begged God three times to remove what was called a thorn in the flesh And God simply said, no. Or think about Jesus who petitioned God to rid him of suffering the night before he was to die on a cross. And God said, no. Another thing I'm learning is that God is not required to answer our prayers with a yes. God, like a loving father, sometimes says no. Lizzie was 13 years old, or about to turn 13, when her mom decided she was going to throw her a surprise birthday party. And mom got um, her favorite cake, picked out her decorations in Lizzie's favorite colors, planned an amazing afternoon with her favorite friends, and together they would all be a part of this sneaky little scheme. But when the day for the party arrived... Mom, turns out, wasn't the only one who had dreamed up a birthday plan. 
Turns out that Lizzie had devised one too. And on this special day, over breakfast that morning, she announced to her mom, I want to go to the movies with my friends this afternoon. Will you drive us to the theater, mom? Now, mom wished she could have explained the answer, but she took a deep breath, praying that her daughter would trust her, and then replied with a kind but firm no. As you can imagine, Lizzie was irate. Instantly, she accused her mother of being uncaring and unfair and was determined to spend the rest of the day pouting in protest. But fortunately, Mom refused to be swayed by her pouting because she knew something the daughter didn't know. Mom's present no was protecting Lizzie's future, yes. And ultimately, these plans for a birthday party, in fact, were good. And later that day, when the disgruntled diva waltzed through the front door right into the middle of her own surprise party, and as a noisy rendition of happy birthday filled the room, she suddenly realized and understood the reason for mom's no. And Lizzie ran to her mom and said, thanks for spoiling my plans today, mom. Yours were even better. Sometimes, when my plans don't unfold as I hoped, When I'm praying for open doors, yet they remain closed. When I'm pleading for a yes, but the answer is no. When I'm asking for a change, but everything seems to stay the same. I need to remind myself of the truth that Lizzie learned. A frustrating no may be setting the stage for a future yes. After all, I have a heavenly father who knows things that I don't. And sometimes he needs to wreck my agenda in order for his to come to pass. Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. This is what Almighty God has to say about us. He's got plans for every single one of us. Not to destroy our life, not to make life miserable, but plans to prosper us, plans to give us a hope and a future. But it takes some faith. It takes some real faith to believe that promise when life isn't going as we'd expect it. Number three, I'm learning we don't need to understand all of God's ways to accept his will. We simply need to trust his heart. You see, when God says no... We're sometimes tempted to wonder if he really loves us. That seems to be a go-to thing. God, don't you love me? But in reality, it's because God does love us that he sometimes says no. You've got to understand that the Bible's full of things about God. The Bible tells us that God is love, that God is kind, that God is trustworthy, that God is for us, not against us. And when we remember who God is, we can more readily embrace what he's doing, even if he says no. You've probably realized that God's plans don't always mirror yours. And you've probably also experienced the fact that sometimes he actually surprises us. I believe there will come a day when we'll look back at our lives through eternity's lenses And we'll want to throw our arms around our loving, heavenly, faithful father and say, thanks for spoiling my plans, Dad. Yours were even better. I want to take you on a journey in the book of Acts to about Acts chapter 16. The book of Acts is a book that highlights the beginnings of the church. It highlights the coming of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit that is being poured out on people and how people function in and with the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through them. And Paul, this apostle that I mentioned a moment ago, is at a point where he's been traveling doing his missionary journeys. Actually, he's been traveling, sharing the good news of Jesus, the gospel. He's been, he's been planting churches. He's helping to set up and organize local church congregations in different cities that he travels to. And in much of the world that he's traveling in, the people there are Gentiles. 
Now, you might, not, you might know enough about the Bible to know that there was a conflict between Gentiles and Jews. The, the gospel, the, the love of God was first really revealed to Jewish people, and I think they felt like they had a, a, a hold on that. There was a market for themselves, and, and when Gentiles started hearing this good news and started following Christ, there were some that, you know, were upset. It even came to the point where church leaders had to gather together and discuss this matter before it ripped the church apart. And to make a long story short, they ultimately decided that yes, the gospel is for the Gentiles as well. And and the answer was to Paul, this apostle, yes, continue doing what you're doing. Continue to share the good news of Jesus Christ and plant churches. So Paul is determined to continue his missionary journey. He takes on a new partner at this time. He takes on a man by the name of Silas, and Paul and Silas begin, first of all, to visit some of the churches that Paul had organized earlier, simply to go there to encourage these believers to help strengthen these churches. And in Acts chapter 16, verse 6, the Bible tells us that they traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and and Galatia. But look at verse 7. It says, When they came to the border of Mycenae, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. To help you to understand what is happening here, God is telling Paul, no. You're thinking, well, what's up with God telling Paul no to sharing the good news of Jesus? Why is God telling Paul, don't go there and preach the gospel? Because preaching the gospel is certainly a good thing, wouldn't you think? Now, if that was you or me, I would imagine we would probably just throw our hands up in the air, quit and go home and go, all right, it's over. Because if you're like me, we don't handle no very well. And especially when God says no. We don't do well with no even in parenting. Right? Sometimes parents need to tell their kids no. <laughs> yeah. uh, you don't have to answer this out loud, but when's the last time you told your kid no? You see, your role as a parent is not to always make your kid happy. Because if parents learned to say no at appropriate times, they'd probably teach their children how to handle frustration and disappointment and acquire the patience and self-responsibility that they need in order to compete in this global marketplace. Now, popular culture brainwashes us into thinking that we really deserve whatever we want whenever we want it. You can get that through television, through wherever, but... With God, the goal isn't no. No is actually the road to yes. Now, here's a fourth thing that I'm I'm learning, that when God says no, it's not necessarily rejection. It may simply be redirection. I believe our Heavenly Father knows what's best, and he wants what's best for us. I believe that's in his character. I believe his perspective is bigger than mine, his plan is better than mine, and his purpose is greater than mine. But how do you respond when God says no? Is God still good when he has to say what every good parent has to say every once in a while? When God says no, I'm not going to make it any easier right now. No, I'm not going to take this thing away. No, I'm not going to bring them back into your life. See, Paul has had this experience before, you know. Paul had, what I already mentioned, was a, what the Bible calls a thorn in the flesh. Whatever that thorn in the flesh was, it was something that Paul felt like, God, you would certainly take this away because... I'll be a lot more effective if this is gone and this won't hold me back anymore. I'll accomplish far more for you. And so Paul begged God to take it away and God said, no. And he came back a second time and said, pretty please? And God said, no. And he came back a third time and said, pretty please with a cherry on top? And God still said, no. 
Now, I want to ask you, is God still good when the answer is no? Or do you have more of a conditional faith that when God says no, you throw your hands up in the air and go home? When something doesn't happen overnight, when you don't see the results right away, we typically will quit the gym. I went there once. (laughs) When things don't happen overnight and we don't see the results right away, we'll quit church. I went there once. When things uh, don't happen overnight and you don't see results right away, we'll, we'll, we'll quit praying even. Now, it would have been very easy for Paul and Silas at this particular moment to think, well, since God said no, we ought to just pack it up and go back home. But Paul didn't see it that way. Because Paul knew that just because God says no doesn't mean it's over. I don't know what kind of no God might be telling you, or I don't care what kind of no that you've heard from your doctor or somebody else. The Bible says that the one who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it, so it's not over. Here's the fifth thing, and my biggest point of all, God's no is a prelude to an even greater yes. When God says no, he's not trying to mock you. He's not trying to make you miserable. He loves you too much to give you what you ask for when he knows it isn't his best. When God answers with a no, you can be certain that he knows something is better for us that he's bringing. So when we hear a no, we ought to just simply get ready, make room in our heart, And in our life, for God to move in ways that we can't even imagine. Isaiah 55, 9 says, the way I work, God says, the way I work surpasses the way you work, and the way I think is beyond the way you think. I'm not sure why it is we think we we know everything, and we think we know better than God. But can't you look back over your life and identify Many things that you're grateful for that God did not answer. There's probably somebody that you were praying that God would work it out so that you could marry them, and he didn't. And now you look back and go, thank God for that. You might look at a job you were praying for and you didn't get it, and you look back now and go, well, thank God I didn't get that job. That place closed up and everybody was out of work. There's a lot of God's knows that we can look back and identify and say, man, thank God for that. You see, here's another thing I'm learning, number six. God's with you in the no as he's with you in the yes. Now, sometimes we think when God's saying yes, man, he's, he's right there, you know, me and God, we're just tight. But when God says no, you know, we're like, well, where are you? And God's saying, I'm right there. Just because God's given you a no doesn't mean he's left you alone. He's a good, good father, as Chris Tomlin sings. I love that song. I mean, who knows what's on the other side of no? So when God says no, don't pack it up and go home. Don't think, well, I guess it wasn't meant for me. Paul didn't quit and go home. Verse 8. So they passed Mycenae. Now, this is the place where Paul wanted to go, but God said no. They passed Mycenae and went down to Troas. I mean, sometimes you have to pass by your plans to get to God's purpose. So he passed by what he had planned to get to what God had actually purposed. Now, in Troas, the Bible tells us that Paul's waiting in confusion. Now, Paul has to know from experience with that thorn in the flesh thing that even though God won't remove something, he'll give you the grace to go through it. Certainly, he realized that and remembered that. So here he is at Troas, 
Again, not the place he had planned to be, but the place God had purposed for him to be when God gave him a vision. Verse 9, during the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. You see, here's another thing I'm learning. Number seven, if God says no, there's something he knows that I don't know. Continuing on, verse 10, after Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, and the next day went on to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony in the leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. Now, Philippi wasn't the city they had planned to go to, but that's the city God had purposed for them to go to all along. And something you ought to know about Philippi that Philippi was the first place in Europe where God established a church. Philippi is in the northern part of modern-day Greece. Greece kind of does a, a, like a circle up at the top, kind of arc at the top, and Philippi is up in that particular area. In fact, Philippi was the first place in the Western world that Paul established a church. Now, what does that have to do with you and me? other than the fact that we are here in the Western world and a part of a church that started because God first told Paul no. What's on the other side of your no that you'll miss if you pack it up and go home? What's on the other side of your no that you'll miss if you tuck your tail between your legs, disappointed, and deny that God even exists? Now, if you're going to receive a yes with praise, at least receive a no with trust. And be willing to let go of your plan to grasp hold of what God has purposed. As you've got to understand that God has already seen the last frame of your story before he started casting and directing he already knew. So, what do you do when God says no? Now, don't get me wrong. I, I struggle with God's no's too. We can either succumb to those feelings of confusion and sorrow and disappointment and fear, but those feelings are really just the gateway to bitterness and depression. Or we can do, number one, we can trust that God does everything out of his goodness and love. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God. We don't have to understand God's answer to know that it is motivated by love. I'm going to tell you about this lady who was going to take a, a trip flying. She's a little nervous about flying, as maybe some of you are. And since she didn't fly very often, she was even more nervous. Made sure days in advance she had everything in her bags and that her bags were packed. And the day of that she would get to the airport very early. And so she got there, got through security, made her way to the gate, and still had like 45 minutes before the initial call to start boarding would even be given. So she thought, well, maybe I'll get a snack, and she walked over to this snack shop and bought a little bag of cookies and thought, well, maybe I'll give myself a little bit of a treat while I'm waiting on my plane. So there she is, sitting in the gate area, and the cookies are beside her when the guy next to her in the gray suit reached over and took one of her cookies. Well, she didn't really know what to do, but she decided, I'm not going to confront him or anything at this point. I mean, again, she was nervous enough about flying, and so she just took a cookie and just sort of went on with reading her book right there. And he reached over and took another cookie. Then she took a cookie. And he took another cookie. 
And she's thinking to herself, what in the world is going on here? What, what, what is this? Well, as it turns out, as she was sitting there reading her book, she ate about half of the cookies, but he ate about half of the cookies too. And then it came time to start boarding the plane, and the announcement was made, and so she got up, grabbed her scarf, gathered her belongings, and noticed there was still one cookie left. And she wondered, is he going to eat that last cookie, or is he going to let me have it? And sure enough, she made eye contact with this man, and he gestured that she should have the last cookie. Well, of course, she took the cookie and kind of huffed off, throwing the wrappings away, and went on and got in line and boarded her plane. About 45 minutes later, on board reading her novel, she was still distracted by this thing that had happened at the gate. And she thought, the gall of this guy, I cannot believe it. Is this what people do in airports now? When food's sitting next to you, they just reach over and help themselves? I mean, is it okay to just take somebody's stuff without even asking? And she reached into her bag to put away her novel when she noticed her pack of cookies. (laughs) She realized that the pack of cookies sitting on the table next to her at the gate actually belonged to the guy in the gray suit. And she was the one who had been taking cookies without his permission. And in doing so, she made a lot of assumptions. She thought she knew that those cookies were hers when in fact they weren't. And based on her false assumption, she made some bad and erroneous judgments about this guy. She made him out to be a bad guy. You see, sometimes what we think we know can get us into trouble. I think our problem is we think we know a lot more than what we actually do. Imagine if Tiger Woods addressed you on how to get lift of your golf ball out of a sand trap, or imagine if Jimmy Page showed you a trick to play an amazing riff on the guitar, or imagine if Bill Gates talked to you about how to really utilize Microsoft 10. The normal response in the face of greater knowledge and insight is to listen, to learn, and to apply. Their knowledge transcends your own, and only a fool would dare to say, thanks but no thanks, I got this one. In fact, it would be downright rude, it would smack of narcissism and showcase how arrogance begets stupidity. The most basic message of wisdom is really never backseat drive someone who clearly knows more than you and wants to help you. Golf, guitar, gates, God, God. How many times have we told God, I know better, thanks but no thanks, I'll take it from here. We don't really know better, he knows better. We think we know a lot more than we actually do. And based upon what we think we know, we make assumptions. And sometimes we make assumptions, God doesn't love me. God's busy with somebody else. Sometimes we'll make the assumption that maybe God doesn't even exist. But how about we learn to trust God? When you get a no, number two, pray what Jesus prayed facing the cross. Mark chapter 14. He went on a little farther and fell to the ground. He prayed that if it were possible, the awful hour awaiting him might pass by him. Abba, Father, he cried out, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. This is Jesus praying that God would take away the cross and the suffering he was about to experience. But God said no to Jesus. But then Jesus said, 
Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. I believe prayer has the power and the capability of changing things. I do. And I think we ought to pray. And in our prayers, as Jesus even prayed there, we really ought to affirm God's power. And we ought to ask with passion. I'm not saying don't ask. I'm saying affirm God's power and ask with passion. But then accept God's plan. Atheist turned apologist Lee Strobel had a movie recently addresses in his book, The Case for Miracles, how to deal with God saying no. Strobel says, my wife has fibromyalgia. She's been in pain every day for 20 years. She'll be in pain every day for the rest of her life unless God does a miracle. And that miracle hasn't happened, he said. So this is a very relevant issue for me and for her. I know some of you are sitting here right now and you're facing some things and you're praying for an answer, but that answer hasn't come yet. Strobel then decided to discuss this issue with philosopher and professor Douglas Gruthius, whose wife is dying prematurely from dementia. Strobel flat out asked, if you were God, would you heal your wife? If you were God, would you heal your wife? If you were God, would you give yourself that job? If you were God, would you do and fill in the blank? Gruthius' answer shocked him. No, he said. If I were God, I would have his perspective. I would understand all things that God understands, and I would do the same thing God is doing right now. Wow. When healing doesn't happen, when our prayers aren't answered with a resounding yes, it's easy to think we know better than God. We want our wife healed. We want to be given that job. And apparently it isn't happening, so it's easy to start thinking, well, maybe I'm smarter than God. I know better than God. But we all know that's really not true. We need to simply affirm God's power in prayer, ask with passion, and accept God's Number three, what you can do when you get a no. Expect God to give his grace to handle his answer. 2 Corinthians 12. This is the story of Paul and the thorn. Three different times I begged, that's Paul, I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, no, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now Paul says, I am glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I think that's Paul's way of saying, I truly believe that God's no is a prelude to an even greater yes. When what I'm praying for isn't happening, when I'm getting a no, I need to know that God knows better than me. And I need to know in the midst of that waiting time, in the midst of waiting for God to do whatever it is he's going to do, that his grace is sufficient and his grace is all we need. I would imagine some of you are praying about some things that aren't happening yet, or maybe you've gotten a no, and you're ready to throw your hands up and walk away and say, forget this. How could it not be good 
for God to do this, and yet he's not. I know it would be good. You see, we just have a human perspective. He's got an eternal perspective. And he's already written the end of your story before he ever put all the characters together. He already wrote the end of your story and then now back up and now it's unfolding. His grace is all you need. You will find strength in that weakness. You might not understand it now. You might understand it tomorrow. You might understand it next week, next year, but you might not understand it all until you're face to face with him And I think when we all stand face to face with him, there's a lot of us that are going to be saying, oh, I see what you were doing. I see what you were doing. I asked, when's the last time you told your kid no? I can pretty much tell you that whenever that last time was that you told them no, there was probably... (laughs) It was probably a lot of that. It was probably a lot of, you don't love me. To which you probably said, no, I really don't. At least God doesn't do that when we accuse him of not loving us. Now that's the difference between me and God. You don't really love me. Yeah, I guess not. But I'm obligated, I'm committed now, so we're going to live this thing out until you can get on your own. You know, right? Yeah. Um, but then all of a sudden, as the story unfolds, then all of a sudden they realize, oh, now I see. How many times did your parents tell you things when you were a kid and said, Someday when you have your own kids, you'll understand. And then you got your own kids, and you understood, right? God's no is just a prelude to something even greater, an even greater yes for you. Don't panic. Don't fear. Don't throw your hands up. Don't quit. Don't walk out. Don't give up on God. Just trust him. And just pray, not my will, Lord, but your will be done and expect him to give you the grace that's needed for however long that is needed. Let's pray. The possibilities of our prayers, Lord, are enormous. You do answer prayer. Sometimes you answer it just the way we thought it would be answered, and sometimes you answer it in a different way. And when you answer it in a different way, we we get all jacked up and we get all nervous and we get all fearful and anxious, Lord, instead of trusting you. And I know every one of us in this room have done that. And some in this room are doing it right now because we've been praying about this or that. And so far the answer seems to be no. Would you help us to get a better perspective of you? that our trust level would just deepen. We'll trust your goodness and your love no matter what's happening around us. And we'll just pray as Jesus did. Not what I want, Lord, but what you want. And we'll just submit ourselves to that and expect that you'll give us grace to endure, to handle, to encounter whatever it is we need to deal with right now in the meantime. Lord, there's an even greater yes that is coming. It might be coming tomorrow. It might be coming next month. It might be coming five years from now. It might not even come until we're face to face with you, but there is an even greater yes that's coming, and your no is just a prelude to that. So help us to embrace you. I don't know, some of you, maybe you're Faith in God is wavering for this very reason. He he said no. I want to ask that you would just rethink that for a moment. 
And imagine a God who loves you so much that there's no way he's going to give you what you want because he knows what that will ultimately lead to. Now that's love. And if you've got kids, you've done the very same thing to them, but then when God does it to you, you are all up in arms. You need to trust him. Some of you, God's not even uh, really active in your life. There are those times when you have prayed. I I believe we've all prayed at some point. Maybe you're discouraged because the things you prayed about, whenever that was, didn't happen. And so you thought, maybe God doesn't even exist. Well, I'm telling you, he does. And I'm telling you, he loves you. And he loves you too much to give you what you're asking for when it's not in your best interest. And whatever no he's told you is simply a prelude to something even greater, an even greater yes. You need to have faith and trust in him too. And maybe you just need to put your trust in him and, and, and live for him and, and become a Christ follower, become a Christian, become a believer. Stop doubting. We're not to be doubters. We're to be believers, to believe that he is who he said he is and that he loves you and then just embrace that and let him embrace you. I mean, right there at your seat, you can just say, God, I, I don't know. I, I'm going to try this believing thing, and I'm going to embrace you, trusting that you're going to embrace me. When you say yes to him, you embrace his yes for you. And then all of a sudden, his goodness and his blessings are chasing you down so fast you can't outrun them. But you need to have a faith relationship, a trust relationship with him. And I I just plead with you, make today that day that you say, God, I, I want a relationship with you. Now, if your faith's been wavering because you haven't gotten the answer that you wanted, I just ask you to reconsider that. And and maybe you just simply need to apologize to God for making some of the assumptions that you made when, in fact, the cookie was in your bag all along. And if you are praying for something big to happen and it hasn't happened yet, keep asking. Passionately ask. I'm the person that's going to, I'm going to go out believing or you're going to go out me believing for you. But either way, I'm going to keep asking and trusting that God will show me. Sometimes we need to modify how we're praying. Sometimes we just need to be, to passionately endure and keep asking. And he'll give you the grace in the meantime. And Lord, I pray for that. There's people in this room that need grace. Because their answer, that even greater yes, hasn't happened yet. But it's on its way, and I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for joining us this week at Palm Canyon Church. If you'd like to be a part of our generosity team, you can give now through the app or through palmcanyon.org. It's quick, it's easy, and there's a number of ways you can donate. Have a blessed week. This is Palm Canyon, this is home, and we'll see you next Sunday.